On episode 255 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Susan Levy and discuss her book, Your Aging Body Can Talk, using muscle testing to learn what your body knows and needs after 50. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 255. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. For the month of June, 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is going to do a new challenge. Now, this challenge is going to be the 10,000 Step Challenge, and I'm going to challenge you to get 10,000 steps each day in the month of June. Now, we're going to do this one a little bit differently than the other challenges I've done. In this one, we're actually going to use an app. It's called Stride Kick. And with this app, it will actually track your your steps, and it'll connect to your iPhone, your Android, uh, your Garmin, your uh, Fitbit, and it'll actually keep up with the steps and and help you keep up with this. So this is going to be a street challenge on Stride Kick. And to do this, what I'm going to need you to do is to go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash step. And what you're going to find there is a little form that I need you to give me your email address and your name. And all I'm going to do with that then is is I'm going to email you on June 1st, the morning of June 1st, the link to go ahead and connect to this challenge. And with that, you'll be able to connect to the challenge and be a part of the challenge and it'll track your steps and your streak. And we want to try to get a 30-day streak. That's that's the challenge for the month of June. And so I hope you will join me with this. Like I said, it's a little bit different for me to use a third-party app, but I figure this is the easiest way for me to keep up with your strides for me, you know, for us to track how we're all doing. And again, it's a, it's a, it's all set up for us. I just have to launch it on June 1st and that's why I'll give you the link. So I do need you to join the waiting list if you're interested in joining this challenge. And I'm not going to charge anything for this challenge. This is going to be completely free. Uh, so I do hope you'll come join us at 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash step. Now our guest today has extensive training in massage, polarity therapy, nutrition, herbology, and is a registered nurse, a chiropractor, and is certified in acupuncture by the International Academy of Medicine Acupuncture. Our guest today is Dr. Susan Levy. So Dr. Levy, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Hi, Alan. I'm glad to be able to talk with you and your listeners. Now, now your book, Your Aging Body Can Talk, uh, is pretty interesting um, you know, I, I, I obviously a lot of people will use that kind of that phrase, listen, listen to your body. Um, and, you know, it will actually give you some pretty good information about what's going on. Um, can you kind of get into the idea of why you wrote a book um, about this particular topic like this? Well, I'm always telling my patients to listen to their body, listen to what it's telling them. We all have an inner knowingness that we have, some are, of us are really in touch with it and some of us are not. The first example I might use is um, everyone's probably had the experience of walking into a room full of people they don't know for some type of reason, <clears throat> meeting, wedding reception, something of that sort. And typically when you center yourself and really feel your inner feelings, you either feel fairly comfortable or fairly not comfortable in that setting. And our, our inner knowingness guides us in many ways about, you know, correct food uh, choices, dietary choices, um, even relationships. You know, sometimes we have a little inkling that we really like a person immediately or we really kind of mistrust someone when we first meet them or even perhaps uh, see them in a TV show or something like that. So I'm helping people get in touch with that inner knowingness. What can you elicit as information from your inner being about making lifestyle choices and guiding yourself to being healthier, more happy, and more fit? 
Yeah. And and you kind of coined the phrase in this book, you use the coin the phrase you thing. Yes. So I wanted to look f- for a word that didn't have all the uh entangled connotations of the word aging. That word has <clears throat> probably tarnished and isn't as friendly. So I've decided what can we do differently? I mean we're all getting older every single day. But if we can help ourselves not feel like so much of the getting older, not to feel like we're wearing out, like we're having uh, changes happen in our joints that are uncomfortable or uh, lessening the function of some of our important organs, kidneys, liver, heart, if we can preserve a youthful feeling and attitude as we're going through this getting older process, I think we're much, much safer, healthier, and um, much more comfortable. Okay. So that's why I created that word, and I have a little meditation at the back of the book <clears throat> to guide people through a process where they can go to a different time in their life mentally and meditate on what that felt like. And I often encourage people just to pick a time in your life. It can be a certain age or a year or just a time before a particular injury or surgery or emotional loss or big life change. If you go before that, when things were a little more comfortable and really meditate on being there and then get in touch quietly with each area of your body, your organ systems, your joints, your muscles, your brain, your vision, all of those things. And just remember what it was like at that era of time. You are reminding your brain how the body functioned and you're reminding your body itself how it functioned in that earlier phase. Yeah, that's really cool. Now, you introduced a term to me that I, I wasn't familiar with. It was a Japanese term called ikigai. Yeah. Could you take a few minutes and talk about the concept of ikigai, where it came from, what it's kind of about, and how we can use it? Yes, and I'm actually going to spell it because it's so unusual. I-K-I-G-A-I, ikigai. However, um, as we pronounce it, it sounds the uh, I's are attributed an E, a double E sound. It's an Okinawan tradition that everyone is encouraged in the culture to discover their life's purpose. Now, obviously, infants and children aren't getting too involved in that, but they're watching the elders, and perhaps their children or teens are starting to have that inward thinking more than they would in other cultures. But it's very much for, you know, the working-aged adults and the grandparents and great-grandparents to really put a great value on understanding what their life's purpose is. And so the beautiful part is the culture expects people to have defined what their life's purpose is, but gives them plenty of space to modify and change that at will. So an example could be, let's say, a young mother who has an infant, her first infant in her arms. A lot of her life's purpose is about ensuring that that little infant has all the best for itself, Uh, safety, comfort, proper feeding, nourishment, love, etc., and by the time that woman and the, the couple are empty nesters, their older years will be much better if they can revise that inner programming of being the, the caring parent of a helpless little baby. Now they have to be able to let that bird fly out of the nest. They have to be able to look at, okay, what's the next step? What should I focus on in this part of my life? 
how can I rejuvenate myself or how can I go back and fill in some blanks I didn't have time for. Sometimes finding our ikigai means that we're looking for new activities, new endeavors, new learning adventures, new physical activities, new travel experiences, and um, putting our efforts there for a period of time. And then we may decide to move forward into a new phase, a different ikigai. For some people, it might be studying their genealogy historically and going back as far as they can or unraveling the twisted uh, rope of their their own ancestral history. You know, people sometimes find interesting little quirks they hadn't known or expected, um, different cultural inputs into their gene pool. Um, so the ikigai is looking at your inherent purpose, but your inherent self-worth. And I think when we're looking inward to figure out what our self-worth is, we're not trapped by the uh, mirage of looking in the reflection of the trappings, the physical trappings or even work accomplishments that some people want to tag their self-worth to. So in this culture, sometimes when people retire from a very successful career, they feel lost because they don't know how to reset their internal purpose. You know, if they're not now being in charge of a large corporation and managing many people and um, seeing, you know, numbers, graphs going in the right direction and they retire, um, sometimes they feel so lost that some of them actually develop significant health problems. And that's been correlated in this country, in this culture, at many times people retire from an intense and often successful career only to pass from life within months to a year, year and a half, from a heart attack, from cancer, various situations. The Okinawans are some of the longest-lived people on Earth, and I think that that process, of working to define your ikigai and to refine it and then to revise it and to continually think about your self-worth and where you fit into your niche, your culture, your family, your group of associates. Uh, it has so many health benefits, psychologically, physically, mentally, spiritually. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely know the challenge because, uh, you know, us being now empty nesters and, you know, a lot of my peers are, are reaching and they're, they're retiring and, you know, they're like, okay, well, we're, we're all like, well, what's the next chapter? You know, what are you going to be doing? And, you know, it's like, well, I'll play some golf and I don't know. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'm sure, you know, he's like, I'm sure I'll figure something out. And, you know, I, I, I kind of have a plan, you know, with, uh, that's mm-hmm. why I'm doing this, uh, this fitness thing is this is, um, uh, this is sort of my second thing. This is going to be the next thing, uh, my ikigai, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. of where I see my purpose is helping people who are over 40 uh, kind of find health and fitness. And so uh, I really did that's appreciate good. that part of your book of saying, okay, this is kind of what I'm doing without really knowing that that's what I was actually doing. <laughs> well, that's great. And so that shows likely that you were more balanced and your your work life and your private life were probably more balanced than, you know, the, the not always, not person. always, well, no, not always. But but okay. it, and I I have I have that has been uh, a a life's work for me. I I would say life's work that I've really only seen success uh, in the last few years. But uh, yeah, it, it was it was something that I realized years ago. I was out of balance and really put some effort into trying to rebalance my life, and it took me quite a while. Uh, to kind of get to a point where I was, I was actually seeing that balance start to happen. Uh, but yes, now right. I feel much more balanced and uh, you know better relationships, uh, 
better fitness and um you know I, my work Very life good. is fine and uh, i you know i'm not i'm not as I, th- I think the thing is i'm not always as stressed by work because i know i have everything else in in line so it kind of helps it does it does and then you know if, if with your show and if, with my book and with us touching other people and helping encourage that hopefully we can have younger people people are in our generation and younger people learning to think in this light you know to look at having more balance between work play self improvement self development education you know reaching out community service all these different things if we can our, our cultural society and the and the happiness quotient of most people i think will be best if if there's more emphasis on balancing these areas and and giving effort to each of them. Okay. So that's great. Now, as a personal trainer, I I would be remiss if we we didn't talk about movement because you did have Mm -hmm. a a, a good bit about movement in the book. Um, And you went through a kind of a series of different types of movement techniques, uh, some that are very, I'm very familiar with others uh, a little less. So, uh, could you kind of go through some of those techniques that you had in the book of how someone who may, you know, who said maybe sedentary now can kind of incorporate more movement into their lives? Okay. Well, uh, this was a, an interesting study. I think I knew some of this in a uh, more of an experiential way, uh, but I did it really research and look into the information that's out there, and I was really excited to find a book by Dr. James A. Levine, who coined a term, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that's a fairly big mouthful of uh, words. He abbreviates it to N-E-A-T. <clears throat> but the bottom line is he did a, quite a bit of study and research and found the bad effects on human beings physically, but also emotionally, from being sedentary or for having hours of sedentary uh, lack of activity each day. And he, he was, his scientific approach was incredible, but uh, not to bore everyone with the little details, but he actually had little movement devices that now we have the Fitbits and the tracker type things. He started that sort of uh, evaluation long ago and then made correlations for different health markers for these the people that he was working with. And he eventually worked quite a bit with school children and found if he could keep them up out of the chair and moving more, that they had less behavior problems and they could focus and learn. And, you know, if they could alternate intense focus on math with then a few minutes of movement, exercise, running and playing, giving more activity. And he developed the standing desk. And I took his information to heart um, because... When I was reading his book in preparation for writing my book, I created two standing desks for myself at two different workstations that I commonly use. And that, you can buy an expensive one, you can have a motorized one with height variability, or you can be very simple. I have an L-shaped desk arrangement, a large old antique desk and a long uh, side table. And on the side table, I just placed a two-foot-high box, a nice wooden box, and that's where I put my laptop, and that's where I do most of my research and work. And if I I get tired of standing, I can move that over to the other desk and sit down. But I did most of this book standing, um, which is really good. He also encouraged people to walk at work, and so now some, some workplaces actually have a walking track, indoor walking track, or have the offices arranged so that they may have some cubicles around the perimeter but a walking track in the middle. And they encourage the folks that work there that have meetings together 
to walk during the meeting or if they have a long phone call coming up to walk as they're talking on the phone. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been putting the hint out there that I would love a, a walking uh, uh one of the treadmills for my desk. I have, I have an adjustable desk, oh, yeah. one of those fancy ones. I got lucky. My, right. my office bought one, and then when we moved offices, they said, well, this isn't going to match our furniture there, so we'll let you buy this, and they let me buy it at a, a steep discount. And then they bought oh, me wonderful. another one for that place, you know, so in, in the format of the furniture they have there. So I actually have an adjustable desk at the office, and I have one here uh, in my office slash studio. And, uh, mm-hmm. But I've been hinting that I would, I would love to have a... Um, one of those little desk treadmills that you know does the little one or two mile per hour um, exactly. underneath you. So, uh, hint, hint, if you're out there good. and want to buy me something, that's 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 what I'm looking for. <laughs> okay, yes, put that put your uh, shopping list out there. <laughs> and then I I talk about Tai Chi, and many people know of Tai Chi. There are different forms, and there are many different disciplines, and sometimes we just lump a few of them together and call it Tai Chi, so I don't want to offend uh, anyone who's a student of, of related uh, techniques, but there's been quite a bit of research done on Tai Chi and Qigong, but they name it all Tai Chi in the research studies. But Tai Chi is a very wonderful flowing dance-like motion uh, as its basis, and often you put your feet one a little forward from the other one, about a half, a full foot length or half, uh, or half of a length. You'd find a comfortable stance, and you rock from forward to backward, and that's the most basic beginning instruction for Tai Chi and many other movements and steps and arm movements and graceful movements are added. And, but just standing and rocking back and forth like that, slightly. You don't have to do it extremely. But that's another way to use a standing desk if you don't have the, the little treadmill aspect to it. Uh, if you get starting to get fatigued of just standing, then you rock a little forward, a little backward, a little forward, a little backward. Um, but with the Tai Chi, um, I hope most people have seen at least on video, if not in person, a park full of people doing Tai Chi in synchrony is just beautiful. And it's uh, practiced in China, uh, but all over the world. But in China, you'll see these pictures of you know hundreds of people gathering um, early morning, often. But you can do Tai Chi anytime it works for you. And they, in synchrony, go through pattern of different mo- motions or movements that have names, stork, standing stork, and, you know, all kinds of interesting names. Um, there's, but the research has shown total body uh, benefit from diminishment of pain, stiffness, um, improving sleep, improving a sense of well-being, bringing up the energy level, um, helping with stamina, and then other specific help to several of your glandular and organ systems, your respiratory system, skin, heart and lungs, your whole nervous system, the digestive system. Many of these have been measured to be improved by people who had a baseline measurement first, then started a six- or eight-week course of Tai Chi, and then being remeasured. And the same with yoga. Yoga is wonderful for flexibility, for calming this the mind, calming the self, getting in touch with yourself and with your breathing. They put a large focus on breathing. And the same kinds of research have been done with very much similar findings that uh, mental, emotional, neurological, cognitive function, endocrine function, insulin balancing, for an example, um, blood pressure balancing, a lot of these things are benefited by the regular practice 
of yoga. Yeah, and the cool thing about yoga is there's there's multiple styles. So if you go into mm-hmm. a class and you don't really like the style uh, that you're doing that day, uh, you can you know take another class and it, it could be an entirely different uh, experience. Exactly. And also for people who have you know some physical disability or limitations, there are sitting yoga classes. Uh, if, it, if someone doesn't have the balance that they need or, you know, has weakness of their legs or paralysis. um, Tai Chi and yoga can both be taught in a a chair position, and there are instructors who specialize in helping folks with specific needs or disabilities or, you know, just need to be careful of one of their knees. Um, Those can be modified and redesigned. And another one I talk about is eccentrics. And that is a method that uses principles from uh, yoga, tai chi, ballet, stretching. Uh, that was developed by Miranda Esmond White. Yeah, we've been fortunate been enough to have her on the show. She's actually been on the show before. So, oh, I'll, I'll, so I'll link to that show in the show notes. Oh, that's wonderful. So I am quite a fan of hers, and I'm so wonderful she developed this system and um, portrays it so well on a lot of her videos that are so available to to people these days. And she has great principles that she's applied, and I think a lot of people can benefit from that. So that that those are three disciplines we might say that are you know have a structure and a format. And we need some instruction for them to do them correctly. And then, again, for people with injuries or disabilities, they just need a little bit of fine-tuning and they can have that system work for them. But just anyone who's able to walk at all, who's not wheelchair-bound, say, um, should look at walking as the most simple, the most basic thing, and walking with a purpose. Um, We can walk at varying speeds. We can walk focusing on our breath or doing um, actually extra deep breathing for a stint for a period of time. Um, We can walk to work through an issue, like a mental Quandary, you know, should I take that new job or should I really marry that fellow or <laughs> should I let my daughter date that guy? <laughs> or beef or pork for dinner. <laughs> right, right. So there's a lot of things that can be decided while walking. And I think it lets us touch the earth more than some of the other activities, especially if those are done indoors. But if you get outside, and walk, you can touch the earth, you can have that fresh air, you can notice, you know, which flowers are blooming, and maybe you'll see certain birds or a little bit of wildlife. So I think that um, walking is wonderful. And I have a little little segment in the book, a very, very short bit, but I encourage people with stiffness in their back or low back problems, or Parkinson's, to, in a very safe, controlled environment, to practice some backwards walking. When we actually walk backwards, we're exercising some of those lumbar, low back muscles differently and loosening them up. And some people with disc problems can use this as a therapeutic, you know, instead of getting up and popping a pain pill, to actually walk backwards. So the safe way, of course, would be to clear out a hallway of any trip potentials and even use a mirror if you want to, a little handheld mirror, or have a person guide you for the first few times. It's, it seems so strange in the beginning. Or, or even if you, if you had access to a treadmill holding onto the rails and putting on a mm-hmm. very slow speed uh, would allow mm-hmm. you to do that safely. And, and, and that's the- another... 
certainly. Yeah, and the reason that works is what you're, what you're basically doing is, you know, both sides of the muscles, antagonist and, and, and protagonist, are working. And so if you're having problems with your lower back, that's because it's very tight. And when you mm-hmm. start trying to walk backwards, you, you're kind of reversing the muscular which one's being the protagonist and which one's being the antagonist, and it's allowing right. your posterior chain to kind of relax. Exactly. Exactly. And then some people with Parkinson's, uh, advanced Parkinson's, sometimes, because of the neurological changes, sometimes it's easier for them to walk backwards as far as more smooth, easy-to-initiate motion. With advanced Parkinson's walking forward, can be very hard to initiate, and once they get going, then it's a little bit easier. But giving that variety, and of course, for that person, they really should have a, you know, a spotter yeah. right with them. Um, but anyway, that and then can make it fun to if for many of us to mix it up and have forward walking, backward walking, and then we can do some side stepping, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think the lateral movement is very important because it kind of helps with your balance. And, you know, for Mm -hmm. folks that we get a little older, um, Mm -hmm. you know, most people that end up hurting themselves and breaking a hip, it's it's not because they fall forward or fall backwards. It's because they fall sideways. Right. And so having that capacity and that that ability to deal in a lateral plane and be a little bit stronger that way is going to is going to protect your balance just a little bit better. Strength. Strength does kind of enhance balance when you when you work them together like that. Right. And then, um, I just barely mention it, but in, uh, in my book, but square dancing, dancing, many kinds of dancing, but square dancing is, I think, a very therapeutic kind of dance because, and, and you'll find often it's, it is people starting at 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, that feel they have the time <laughs> to, to <laughs> devote to it. And, and we quit, really we quit caring what people think about us now. <laughs> Pardon me? We quit caring what people think about us. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. But um, you really have to learn the steps. But the wonderful part is you have to hear the auditory cue, the caller who's calling the dance and telling you what to do, says, you know, to do a certain movement. And you have to hear that and translate it into motion. So it's a body-mind it's more of a, a little more challenging of a body-mind kind of thing, and then you have to do it in tandem with your partner and in concert with the three other duos or couples that are in that square. So it, it's quite a good exercise, and there's some sidestepping. There's some backward walking uh, involved there, too, a little bit. And then I bring up chiropractic. That is my training. But um, to help us stay mobile and flexible, chiropractic care is wonderful and quite helpful. Um, I have had some patients where they come in to the office after some type of injury or problem, very restricted in motion, we might even measure the range of motion, and then with the treatment, and my choice is to do a milder sort of chiropractic approach, but I also work out the muscles. If they have really stiff muscles, I will goad them, massage them, work them over, um, get that loosened up, and then we can remeasure and find there's better, uh, significantly better uh, numbers on their range of motion and the flexibility. Just the ability to turn your head is when you haven't been doing that very well, looking over your shoulder for uh, backing up your car, things like that. The The night and day difference sometimes after chiropractic treatment is refreshing and uh, relieving and <laughs> gives you a whole new new perspective sometimes. And when we have chiropractic treatment, we're actually reintegrating the nervous system and the musculoskeletal system. So there's, when there's a glitch called a subluxation or um, a lack of good 
lineup or alignment between the bones, the vertebra and or arms, bones of the arms and legs. But when those are out of balance, it also affects the nerves, and then that can affect the circulation, and the body just isn't working nearly as well. But when we start to get all that lined up, repositioned, take the kinks out, get things more balanced, the whole body functions better. And the, that includes the organ functions, the endocrine functions, the glandular functions. So that um, is an important piece that, you know, wasn't uh, considered much for many people uh, in the past, but I think more and more are understanding the value of getting chiropractic treatment and, and other body work, too, uh, from massage to acupuncture. You know, there's just so many good things we can do for ourselves. And when we are balanced in those ways, then we can proceed with whatever fitness tool or methodology we feel like doing. Cool. Cool. Now, you in the book, you give uh, some, some just some basics for kind of getting started. Uh, do you mind going through your basics? Um, basics of yeah, you um, call it the move it, move it, move it, or pre- move it and preserve it basics. Okay, move it and preserve it basics. Okay, um, I think the main thing is find what's comfortable for you. You know if somebody tells you they love to play a certain sport and you find that not comfortable or a little bit just outside your box, don't push yourself into one discipline that's that's just not you. You want to find what works with you. And then the main thing is to really focus on minimizing being sedentary. Lessen your sitting time for for anyone, you know. And um, I mean, if you if you're retired and you're talking on the phone to different family members in different parts of the country, stand up while you're talking. Walk around the room. Um, take the phone outside and take a little walk. Um, incorporate more purposeful movement into your daily life. Um, I'm notorious for not parking close to wherever I need to go, necessarily close. It's not always a huge distance away, but I'll walk and um, the distance. And then when I need to move things from the car to the house or wherever I'm going, I just try to you know, not load myself up with too many pounds on, and make one trip, but maybe break it down into two or yeah, three trips. I'm so guilty of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and then, you know, you can be looking around, noticing a little bird or the patterns of the clouds in the sky or the neighbor's dog, uh, you know, what's he doing, you know. <laughs> And we can have spend our minutes doing observation. And then just find some of your favorite movement, stretching, exercise, sports, or athletic activities, and give them your best. But then, you know, you, you don't want to burn out on any single thing. So switching, having variety, doing something new and different within your tolerance level. It's not an overkill or an overdue. Um, those are wonderful activities. And, you know, if you have little kids to play with, like perhaps grandchildren, uh, some people great-grandchildren, just watch what they do. They make a fun game out of anything. <laughs> 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 and if you can just not be too embarrassed to do that, <laughs> we can mimic those little kids or get down and play with them. Make just a fun little game out of just almost anything, but add some motion into it. Okay. Now, um, in your youthing lifestyle, 
Uh, you provide uh, the, what you call the nutritional bottom line, where you have some things that you should include and things you should exclude. Can you go through a few of the includes and that you think are the most important and, and a few of the excludes that you think are most important? Okay. So for include, we want to be sure and have variety of healthy foods. So the, the very bottom line is unprocessed, unadulterated, no chemicals added, um, if you're reading on a, ingredients on a label, they need to be words you understand and can pronounce. But if you eat more things that don't even have labels because they're fresh produce, um, nuts, grains, seeds, and if you're eating meat, you want to get the very best, cleanest meat that if you can get organic, great. If you can get grass-fed, wonderful. If you can go through a food co-op or... Um, have family or friends that raise their own products, uh, meat, dairy, eggs, and get those where you're more uh, assured, you know, that they're having uh, the best chemical-free and preservative-free conditions. And then really focus on vegetables, fruits. Organic is wonderful. Non-pesticide used is wonderful. Going to your farmer's market, growing things yourself. You know, if you're able to do that, if you're set up, uh, if your home life is set up, that you can do that. And people are doing all kinds of creative things like having uh, raised beds, uh, small greenhouses. Aquaponics is another great thing where you have a large tank with some koi fish or uh, tilapia some people have. Have you heard about aquaponics? I I have, yeah. 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 So then the excretions of the animals have a lot of nitrogen, and that's pumped up above the tank into that uh, raised garden bed. All this can be done in a garage, a basement, a greenhouse. You just have to have the right lighting or add lighting. And you can grow beautiful plants that are being fertilized by what the fish are uh, releasing into the water. You know, so there's just wonderful things like that. But I think make sure you don't buy the same things week after week after week. Make variety. When star fruit's available, get that. It's only available for a short time. But add a little star fruit as something different. It's going to have a little bit of different nutritional content than the things you're going to eat year-round. It tastes a little bit like a pear, um, but it's something new and different. Yeah. And do uh, mix it up. Make it fun. Um, I sometimes take salads. I love to get salad greens, uh, the baby greens, all organic, and I grow quite a few. I've got French sorrel right now, which is very lemony to add in. But put all those greens and then just look around the house and Sometimes I put walnuts and dried cranberries and feta cheese, and sometimes I'll put little um, tangerine segments, the mini tangerines, and raspberries, and sometimes pomegranate seeds. You can throw so many wild and different things into your salad. You don't have to stay with what seems to be the tradition. Um, Nuts, seeds... Things like that are really good. And then um, be sure to use glass containers for your food storage. I use mason jars. I have every size from half gallon down to jelly jars. The lids are reusable. They wash well. You can see what you've got in the fridge easily. And they don't absorb any chemicals like would happen with a plastic. Yeah. That's a good there. idea. I like that idea. Thank you. Yeah. And then look for the best kinds of pan, pots and pans. Um, glass is really good. Uh, cast iron, enamel-covered cast iron, or enamel-covered, um, I didn't say that right, enamel-covered pans, enamel-coated metal pans. Um, but... Stainless steel has thought to be really good over the years, and now we're finding there's probably a little metal 
leaching into the food from that. But uh, the visionware pans are quite good. They're all glass. You just have to be really careful with them. And they heat up more quickly, and they cool off more slowly. So you have to use, you lo- use less uh, cooking heat, actually, with those. Oh, cool. So you want to exclude the things that don't match what we've already talked about, pretty much. You want to exclude processed and packaged foods to the best of your ability. There are times when you're just, you know, time and space and the situation or you're a guest at someone's home and things like that happen or you're traveling. But the more you plan ahead when you travel or if you're going to a dinner at someone's home, you can offer to bring a dish that you can mainly focus on what you brought because you know the ingredients. But you want to leave out all those artificial flavorings, artificial colors, um, BHT. There's this uh, chemical called diacetyl, which is the artificial butter flavoring. It's in microwaved popcorn. And that was fascinating to research, but there were some large lawsuits of the workers in the plants that made this diacetyl stuff. And and so unfortunately, it's in the microwave popcorn that you buy, but it's that or something similar is typically what you're going to find in a movie theater or other place that serves popcorn. Um, you can try to get plain from those places, and when you ask the person, they'll say, well, we have to put some in there for the lubricant. <laughs> it's pretty much like a motor oil or something. <laughs> So you definitely want to leave that alone. Um, Look at your um, dried fruits. If they have sulfur and various things added, they're not the best. Sulfur dioxide, that's not the best form of sulfur. So you want to just get the... Uh, the more natural ones, and you have or, to or dry it yourself. I mean, you can get a hydrator and do that exactly. yourself. Exactly, exactly. So anything that is easily accessible in your area, you can do. I have a large Excalibur dehydrator, and I do oh gosh, all kinds of things. And I'll buy apples by the case at the right time of year and dehydrate them and have them for months into the future. I have shiitake mushrooms. My whole pantry is full of <laughs> lots of ball jars or those uh, mason type jars filled with dehydrated items and you can actually buy a little instrument to to pull the air out when you seal that rubber rimmed lid down so they can it's a vacuum seal okay so I, I, I knew i knew you could do it if you if you heated them you know they they, they would do that i i didn't know there was a, a tool that would yes. do that it, okay well it's um what do they call those? It's the one, it's a little machine that's save a meal or something where it's a, okay. you get a plastic bag and you can seal the plastic bag. And that's got pros and cons. But those, that same little meal saver, I think it's called. Yeah. But it has a, a tube. It's an extra implement you buy, a tube and then a round fitting that goes around the canning jar. And it will um, vacuum out all the air. And then those last for years. Okay, cool. So you want to avoid the um, dairy, eggs, protein, poultry, and all of that that has had hormone injections or hormones added to the feed. Well, how do you know that? Pretty much it probably did unless the label is saying pasture-raised, free-range, free maybe, maybe not, but pasture-raised, no BHT used. You have to look for all these things, and yeah. it's kind of. Uh, or like you said, go to a, go to the co-op. Go go to, to exactly. a friend. Go to a farmer that you know, and exactly. then, you, then you know what you're putting in your body. Exactly, and then stay away from sodas. There is just nothing good about sodas. Sugary beverages, sweetened juice, you, you juices. You can find everything. You can find an alternative to any of those. If you or someone in your family has gotten hooked on one of these things, you can do something different that's comparable in taste or texture that's natural and good. And then we want to 
avoid the typical tap water unless it's heavily uh, filtered or processed to get out all the junk that could be in in there. And now one of the biggest problems is medication residues are leaching in from people flushing medications down the toilet or even as people process the medication in their body and they have a residue when they urinate that and then that water gets reprocessed, the chemicals stay behind. And there, there's measurable amounts of drugs in many municipal water systems, so it's, it's awful. But then the fluorine and the chlorine, or now they use chloramine more often, all these things are just not healthy. So having your own water filter is one of the best things, and I use a Berkey filter. Um, I think it's just wonderful. But there's lots of different types of systems. And I always tell people, you well, the quality of the water depends on what you spend, pretty much. If you get a $39 water filter, you will not be removing much out of it. Yeah. Pretty much it goes into the $300 range to get something valuable. And then one of the reminders is to stay away from styrofoam packaging, styrofoam um, you know, leftover boxes from restaurants, and some places are changing that. And um, the, you know, like drinking cups that on the bottom say number six, that is polystyrene. <clears throat> when you have a cold liquid in there, it's not nearly as problematic as if you would put, oh, try to make tea or have coffee in yeah. one of those. Well, Dr. Levy, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, If someone wanted to reach out, wanted to learn more about you, learn more about the book, where would you like for me to send them? Um, Yourbodycantalk.com is my website. And we also have a Facebook um, channel. What do we call that? A Facebook uh, account? Yeah. It's Your Body Can Talk as well. And Dr. Susan Levy. So those would be the two ways. And my book is pretty much available at any book selling outlet, online, in stores. And pretty much now that it came out a week ago, or, or early May, um, it can be within three to four days, it can be acquired by any bookstore that doesn't have it in stock. Right. And you've given us, I mean, there's a whole lot more in the book where you go into inflammation and you go into detoxification. So this really is a book kind of for a holistic uh, start to finish kind of way to improve your life and improve your health. Um, And as you said, uh, kind of find your ikigai uh, and kind of live the life that you you want to live. So thank you so much. This is going to be episode 255. So if you go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 255, you'll find all those links and links to the book and everything else we talked about today. So again, Dr. Levy, thank you so much for being on 40 Plus Fitness. Oh, Alan, thank you so much. I've truly enjoyed talking with you and letting people get an idea about how their body is talking to them. If you enjoyed today's episode, would you please share it with friends and family? Thank you. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we're going to bring back Maria Emmerich and discuss her new cookbook, Keto Comfort Foods. Now, this book, is it literally changed my life. This is an awesome cookbook. Um, we talk about keto. Uh, we talk about some food. Uh, I hope you'll join us next time when we talk about keto comfort foods. Until then, have a happy and healthy day.